You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Zoonotic diseases, those that can affect animals and people, have been on the minds of the world watching the outbreak of Ebola in Africa. There are other shared diseases that may be in your own backyard, thankfully, much less deadly, treatable with medical care, and preventable with readily available vaccines. My guest, Dr. Richard Edling, Senior Associate Director, Pet Professional Services for Behringer Engelheim Vet Medica, will lay bare the facts and fallacies surrounding the disease leptospirosis. We'll be right back after this short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's talk pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Edling, thank you so much for being with us. You've been on the show once before, so I really appreciate you coming back. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. So leptospirosis, we want to get into that, but first give the listeners a little background about who you are, how you came to be this professional veterinarian for Behringer Engelheim. Well, Bernadine, I am, as you said, Senior Associate Director of Pet Professional Services, which just basically means that I manage a group of veterinarians that uh, support the sales of our products. And I was in small animal practice and still actually do some small animal practice. But basically, we just provide technical support. Now that I'm kind of gone into management, I don't do it quite so much. But uh, until about a year or so ago, I used to run around the countryside lecturing to veterinarians. And I have to say that veterinarians, it's so great having services such as yours because there are times we don't know it all. And one of the things I learned in veterinary medicine is not so much knowing, and when I was in veterinary school, of knowing it all, but knowing who to ask and where to look and who to ask. So someone such as yourself, there are times when I have a condition or a medication going, I just don't know and I can't find it, give you a call. So yes, that's what I appreciate. That's exactly what we're here for. Leptospirosis. Tell us a little bit about leptospirosis. Well, leptospirosis is really an interesting disease. It's actually an infectious disease and it's caused by a bacteria called Leptospira interrogans. The organism actually is found throughout the world. It's found in soil and especially in water. It's interesting in that there's a lot of different strains of the bacteria, and because of that, it also infects a lot of different species of animals. So 150 different mammalian species can be infected with lepto. It occurs relatively commonly in dogs. It can occur in cats, but is extremely rare. In dogs, it causes a disease that in the early signs of infection are really very vague. So things like, you know, lethargy, they just don't have a good appetite, maybe vomiting and fever. Um, and some dogs, that's all that it, 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 it goes to. But however, in a few dogs, it actually can get into pretty severe kidney, liver, and even respiratory disease. And if left untreated, some dogs can actually die from the infection. But it doesn't seem to affect the vocal cords of the dogs in the background. It doesn't in the background, and that's, <laughs> I apologize for that. 
No, they're just saying, hey, dad's doing an interview. This is good, like kids, you know, when you're on the phone. <laughs> That's especially my chocolate lab. Yes, she is quite vocal. So if she doesn't get what she wants, so she's quite spoiled. So I apologize. One of the for things, that. not at all. I have cats that, you know, meow in the background here. One of the things I think that people oftentimes, if they've ever heard of leptospirosis, going, oh, it's going to be a disease that does affect Labradors because they're the hunting dogs. They're the dogs that are out there. They're going to get the exposure. But it's not just those guys, as I understand. You could have that wonderful suburban dog who's minding their own business, walking in the neighborhood, and uh, just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, sniffing and licking as dogs will do, getting exposed to this particular organism. And it sounds like it's a really difficult disease to diagnose because, I mean, it comes in for lethargy. That can be a plethora of different diseases that are causing it and maybe just being a little bit off. So what are some of the usual sources? Well, actually, yeah, dogs normally become infected when their mucous membranes, so the, the lining of their mouth or their respiratory tract, come in contact either directly with infected urine, because it's usually shed through the urine, or indirectly through urine-contaminated soil, maybe food, water, even bedding. They can, it's, it's much less common, they can become infected by a bite from an infected animal, eating infected tissue from an infected animal, rarely through breeding, and it's actually even possible for an infective mom to actually pass it to her pups uh, in utero. So with these dogs that are minding their own business in the backyard, you could have an infected mammal what, like a possum or some other little creature going through the backyard, urinating, the dog just goes along going, oh, who's been there and get exposure? It sounds like, wow, it's everywhere. Exactly. I know in my own yard, we have a nice yard and we have, we irrigate and we have possums and raccoons and skunks that are regularly seen in the area. And even though I do have a lab who you might think would be the typical case of a, of a dog getting lepto, I also have two little pugs and they are just as susceptible being in the backyard if they come in contact with water that one of those critters has actually urinated in. I know it was a couple of years ago, I think it was up in Oregon, there were these triathletes. They were swimming through one of the local rivers as part of their challenge, and that a number of them came down with leptospirosis, and it was because of the water, and they just had scrapes and scratches on their skin from going through hill and dale, and then got exposed to leptospirosis. How do people, and that's what I said at the top, that this is a zoonotic disease, something that affects people and animals. How do people typically get it? Yeah, it's actually interesting because while it's very uncommon for people in the U.S. to get lepto, around the world it's actually the number one zoonotic disease. And while it is possible to actually get it from you're getting contact from urine with an infected dog, most people, exactly the way that you just described, get it through um, cuts and scratches on their skin, and then it gets absorbed through those when they come into contact with water that's been infected with leptospirosis. So it sounds like it's a real risk for people working with animals that, boy, I just think it has. So at my veterinary practice, a dog comes in that just has these signs of lethargy, nothing too specific. It seems like it can be a real risk for the veterinary personnel as also for that person at home taking care of their pet and cleaning up after them. Very much so, yes. And the problem is, is the clinical signs early on, as we said, are very vague. And so a dog comes in, it's just not feeling well, basically, is how it's presented. And we may not think about it. We may collect a urine sample or we may hospitalize the dog. There may be bedding that becomes soiled. And it's really important that our staff in our veterinary hospitals use precautions so that they don't get infected as well. Is leptospirosis found in all 50 states? Because I know in my own community, uh, you know, there's diseases that we really focus in on. And leptospirosis, and it sounds like I need to change my thinking and that of my uh, colleagues, may not be something that we should ignore. How common is it? 
Well, you know, and I think we've gotten to a point where we don't diagnose a lot of leptospirosis because it is difficult to diagnose. In a lot of cases, a dog will come in with vague clinical signs and we put them on antibiotics and they get better. And so we may not confirm the case of lepto, um, but it's out there and it's out there a lot more commonly than we think of. In some states like Hawaii, it's endemic and in pretty much, you know, all water sources are a good possible source of getting infected with lepto. Other states, say for instance in the desert southwest where rainfall is relatively low, the incidence is much less. But in all those places, especially in urban environments where we're doing a lot of irrigating or agricultural environments, there still can be lepto. The incidence will just be lower. The incident sounds to be low. Any statistics by, say, for instance, the CDC as to how commonly people are diagnosed with lepto? According to the most recent data that I've seen from the Centers for Disease Control show that on average there's, you know, 100 to 200 cases of lepto in people in the U.S. each year. But of those cases in people, 50% of those occur in Hawaii, as I said, where the disease is considered endemic. So, um, you can see it's it's not a huge number of cases in people, but then we're not the ones that are out sniffing around in the grass and the puddles. You know, here's for all those vacationers going to Hawaii and you see those pristine streams that you want to jump in, especially if you've been doing some off-road hiking and, huh, it sounds like paradise may not be as blissful as we'd all hope. Need to be a little bit on the cautious side. See if you bring something else back with you from your vacation. That's true. And especially if you get cuts on your skin. So, I mean, if you've got, you know, intact skin, it's much, much less likely to be, you become an infected. But, you know, as you said, if you were walking through the bushes to get to that beautiful little waterfall and you're wearing shorts and you get cuts on your legs and then you go into those waters, it's very definitely possible that you could get infected with lepto. Dr. Edeline, I have a dog that comes into the practice and just feels blah. That Okay, let's run some general blood work. Let's see what's going on internally. What can I and my colleagues expect to see? Is there anything that I go, ah, yeah, that's lepto? Mm -hmm. It's not that distinctive. And so what you may see, as we said, remember, for dogs that early on, you may not see anything at all distinctive. But certainly for those dogs that do end up having kidney and liver problems, you will obviously see elevations in renal function tests and in liver enzymes. So um, those would be the type of things that I would be looking for in a dog that became acutely ill. Are there any definitive tests going, I think this may be lepto, maybe you were traveling in an area where there is a history of leptospirosis. Is there something I can do to say, yes, this is it? Yeah, the most commonly used test in veterinary medicine is something called the microscopic agglutination test or MAT test. And it's basically running titers for antibodies to the leptospirobacteria. And the the challenge is is that usually to make a definitive diagnosis, we've actually got to do paired samples, which means that early on we take a sample, we send it in the lab for a test. If we have caught that disease early on, the antibody titers may not be high enough for us to diagnose the disease because the body is just responding to the organism. And so um, we asked our clients to come back in a week or two weeks and redo the test, in which case then the body's response will allow for higher antibody levels and and a definitive diagnosis. So that's the most commonly used test. There's also PCR tests that are, are possible, and those have some limitations as well. I'm talking right now. My guest is Dr. Richard Edling. He's a Senior Associate Director, Pet Professional Services for Behringer Engelheim Vet Medica. That's a mouthful. You have a big business card. We've been talking about leptospirosis. We're going to take a short break, be right back, and find ways that we can treat it and prevent it, which is really the best way for our pets and for us. We'll be right back after the short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly right after these messages. Hi. 
Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Hi, this is T.O.D. Anderson, and I'm the host of Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. We're going to talk about a variety of topics on canine behavior and training, all based on modern methods that are fun for you and your dog. We might be talking about other critters, too. So join us on Get Positive Results. We'll talk about common issues between you and your dog, answer your questions, discuss different activities you can do with your dog, and keep you posted on current canine news and products. All this on Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Edling, we've been talking about, okay, the signs are vague. The dog can get it almost anywhere, it seems like. It can be the hunting dog. It can be your pug in the backyard who goes for a walk in the neighborhood. There's a chance that we can get this, and nobody wants to think of your pet giving them any diseases out of the family. But how do we treat it? I know for the longest time, people going, oh, my breeder said or my friend said leptospirosis had a vaccine that was available, but oh, it caused lots of side effects. I am not going to give that to my dog. Have things changed? Yeah, I think things have changed a lot. You know, we've come a long way. And I think it's very interesting on leptospirosis because early on with bacterial vaccines, um, we didn't have a lot of sophisticated technologies to make vaccines. And so we basically took the bacteria, you know, and we ground it up, this oversimplification, of course, and then put it in a vaccine. And there's a lot of other parts of this bacteria that could cause reactions. And so early on, I think it probably was true. Now we've got much better manufacturing capabilities to make vaccines. In fact, there's been some really good studies. There was one in particular by Dr. George Moore at Purdue at the vet school where he actually analyzed a very, very large database of of over a million dogs that were given vaccines, and he showed absolutely no difference in the incidence of reactions to uh, vaccines that included or did not include leptospirosis. So the bottom line is today, if you are in an area where leptospirosis occurs, there's absolutely no reason for the dog not to be vaccinated. Would you recommend, I know you said in Hawaii, it sounds like if you don't do it in Hawaii, you're not the most concerned or probably educated pet owner because it's so common there. But would you say that throughout the United States that all dog owners should get their dogs vaccinated for leptospirosis? What we recommend is we recommend that veterinarians do risk assessment. So okay. when you do risk assessment, they're looking at lifestyle factors. So if there was, for instance, a dog who lived in a high-rise apartment in New York City that just peed on pee pads and never went outside, perhaps that dog may not need to be vaccinated against leptospirosis. It depends upon the area you're in. I live in Northern California. For me, I consider leptospirosis to be a core vaccine. So every dog, when it gets its annual vaccination, should get leptospirosis. And that's common, I'd say, maybe not everywhere in the U.S., but certainly in more areas than not. And I know a lot of people say, oh, wow, you know, I will typically, if I'm going to vaccinate a pet, take it to our treatment area, not do it in front of the client, because a lot of clients don't enjoy injections themselves. And to see their baby being vaccinated, it's like, oh, my goodness, how many more shots do you need to give? The combination vaccines, those seem to be as effective, not a problem. Having it separate from the say, distemper, for instance, should it be given separately or are combination vaccines acceptable? 
Yeah, no, interesting question. In that study that I just talked about with Dr. Moore from Purdue, he actually looked at the issue of vaccine reactions. And one of the things that they looked at was basically there's a higher incidence of reactions in small dogs that receive multiple vaccines. That's multiple injections. If, however, antigens, so lepto given with a distemper parvo hepatitis vaccine, that's just one vaccine. And so um, there was no difference in, in reaction rates when you had a lot of an multiple antigens in the same vaccines. It's what, what's done with us um, in people when you bring your kids in for things like an MMR vaccine. Um, when a company gets a vaccine approved, through the USDA for animals, um, they have to actually prove that it is both safe and effective for every single item, uh, every single antigen that's in there. And so, yeah, combination vaccines definitely work. Combination vaccines um, do not cause an increased incidence of adverse events. And just from the simple perspective, like you, you know, I don't think most of us as veterinarians enjoy sticking needles in dogs and cats any more than dog and cat owners like to see them get stuck in. So um, for me, yes, combination vaccines are a great alternative. They are so nice. Yes, cut it down. One of the things I'll always tell clients, don't be surprised if your pet might not be a little lethargic for the next 24 to 48 hours, could be a little sore in the limb that it's given. We'll usually tell them, okay, we gave the flu vaccine and that's going to be in the right front limb. And we gave a rabies and that's the right rear. So if they say, oh, it's a little sore, they're like, oh, this is why it's that vaccine. Doesn't mean it wasn't given properly, that you know it's not working. It's just you and I get the flu vaccine ourselves. And sometimes you can feel a little bit under the weather for a day or so. So I think when they understand that, sometimes also, and I don't know if you recommend this for those pets that seem to have maybe a bit more of an extensive blah reaction to say, okay, split them up maybe every three to four weeks come back, get another one. It's a bit more time intensive for you as the pet owner, but then you're giving less vaccines at any one time. And I think some of the times you're right. Those little dogs seem to be much more sensitive to the vaccine load. And I think it's a really important point that I like to try to explain to my clients that there's a difference between a response and a reaction. And a response, mm, when I vaccinate a dog, I'm asking, or a cat, I'm asking it, to its immune system to respond to those antigens and produce protective immunity. And so it's a um, normal response for a vaccine for them to be maybe a little lethargic. Maybe they go home and they don't have quite the appetite that day. If they took their dog or cat's temperature, it might be slightly elevated. And those are all normal things that we would expect. It's the adverse events, the, the hives and the swollen face um, that's a reaction, not a response. But you're right. You can either, I think, combination vaccines are very effective in reducing the incidence of reactions rather than giving multiple injections, as well as separating out antigens and giving them at two or three week intervals. Both work. I know this isn't exactly what we were chatting about, but oftentimes people will come in with those little five-pound poodlets saying, how can you give it the same vaccine as you're giving the Great Dane? Shouldn't you give less of the vial because it's just an itty-bitty dog? And could you address that? Well, it actually, yeah, it's a very interesting question, and we do. We, we get that all the time, and it, it intuitively makes sense if you think about it. We give antibiotics based on the body weight of a person. Uh -huh. The thing is, is there is a specific antigenic mass, which is the amount of bacteria or the amount of virus that's necessary to stimulate an immune response. That's the same in a chihuahua as it is in a St. Bernard. And actually, if you look at vaccines, interestingly enough, the amount of actually bacteria or virus that's in there is very, very minute. There are other things, there's diluents, there's buffers and things like that that, that are in there. And so the, the actual amount of the bacteria is very, very tiny. And so if you were to reduce the volume in a small dog, it is likely that you would not get a good immune response from that vaccine. Good answer. Thank you very much. So giving this vaccine, I know some vaccines, 
clients are told, okay, for Bordetella, kennel cough, you need to go in every six months and get this booster. Leptospirosis, how frequently do they need to get that protection given and how effective is it? Well, what we know is that all of the vaccines that are on the market today from major manufacturers are very effective. And there was a great consensus study that was put out by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine where they actually looked at it. They said, yes, you know, the vaccines on the market are currently effective. We know that as a bacterin that the immunity is not as long lasting as it potentially could be for a viral vaccine. And so we know that the immunity will last probably about 12 months, could be a little longer, but certainly for a disease like lepto, you most definitely have to revaccinate annually. Now we've been talking about how to prevent it. What if your animal comes down with it? How do they treat it? How long? You mentioned antibiotics. How long do they need to be on antibiotics? I know Lyme disease, for instance, it could be, seems like years. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it really the thing that we have to understand about leptospirosis is leptospirosis is a disease that presents itself very, very differently in different dogs. And so some dogs have a very, you know, mild transient disease. We put those dogs on short-term antibiotics. Some dogs get much, much sicker. And antibiotics, they may have to be hospitalized. They may have to be on supportive therapies. They may have to be on IV fluids. Dogs get, get that get the severe respiratory form certainly may require ventilation support. So it really depends upon the individual animal. A lot of veterinarians will start out on a short course of, of one particular antibiotic, say ampicillin or amoxicillin, and then they'll go with kind of a longer term treatment with doxycycline to try to prevent any sort of carrier state. So for the animals that have, you know, to get to the point that have the severe respiratory form, is that because it's just their body reacted so vehemently to it? Or is it that the organism was allowed to go untreated for an extended period of time and this is the sequelae? I think it it may be a combination of both. So certainly any, any infection that we diagnose and treat early we're going to be much more likely to be successful and to prevent it going from a mild case of lethargy and anorexia um, to a case of renal failure, liver failure, or severe respiratory disease. But there's some individual variation with the dog as well. So some dogs will be maybe more prone to get more severe disease. If we treat early, Mm -hmm. we're going to prevent that from occurring. Dr. Edling, this sounds just really scary for a lot of pet owners thinking, oh my goodness, you know, my dog's outside, it's a little lethargic, it's, you know, shed through the urine, I have kids, I'm just going to get rid of the dog or I'm not going to have any dogs. What can people do to protect themselves? All you got to do, it's very simple, is make sure your dog's been vaccinated. If your dog's been vaccinated, it won't get leptospirosis and so there really isn't any risk. I love it. That was simple. Okay. My dog got lepto. Now what I do for that dog? How do I protect the family? Well, and once the dog has got lepto, obviously we want to go ahead and make sure that your dog's been treated. So it's on antibiotics. And then it's really quite simple. It's just once your dog comes home, then people in the family need to be careful about hopefully not having any standing water where the dog can pee in so people could come in contact. It's common sense. If a dog has an accident in the house and you have to clean it up, that you make sure that you don't have any direct contact with the urine. So a person would just simply wear gloves, wash your hands afterwards. So it's not that highly contagious. That um, It's rare that people become infected from the urine of their infected dogs. Fabulous. Keep those dogs, keep them vaccinated, prevent a disease that they can get, that you can get. I understand just even using a dilute bleach solution will help. And then if your pet did get it, always the best thing to do is fess up, 
let other people know who may have come in contact, daycare, groomers, neighbors that your dog goes over and has a play date with, that I think you need to have your pet checked if it hasn't been vaccinated. So, Dr. Edling, this has really been very interesting. Thank you. I've learned a lot, and hopefully the listeners have learned some uh, new facts about Lepto to make them aware of it, realize the vaccine is much safer, a lot less side effects, and it really is in your best best interest to have your pet vaccinated. Anything else we should know? Nope. All I would say is that very simply, it's like everything else that when we take good care of our dogs, we recognize the diseases that they are at risk for getting. We make sure that they're vaccinated against them. And that's going to be the best best protection for them and for us both. Don't uh-huh. get rid of your dogs. How could you live without those sweet things? The lab in the back and the pugs who are barking, too. The, so, yes, they've the calmed pugs, down. Yes, yeah, they've calmed down. So, Dr. Edling, thank you so much. Do appreciate it. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor. I'm Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Thanks for listening. Have a great one. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.